Hello, Cardinal fans, and welcome to this edition of Cardinals Nation 24-7 podcast. Joined tonight by my co-hosts, Chris Lawless and Larry Cox. We're going to take tonight's episode and cover the careers and the legacy of two great players that we lost last season. I'm referring to Lou Brock and the great Bob Gibson. Gentlemen, good evening. Good evening. You guys, we're going to start off with Lou Brock, and we wanted to kind of talk about these guys because we lost them last year, and it was a big deal for Cardinal Nation. And before the season started, we wanted to kind of at least take a quick, you know, podcast and go back and go over their careers and discuss just how great these two individuals, excuse me, truly were to the game and to the St. Louis Cardinals organization. Um, So starting off, I just want to kind of touch over a couple of their stats. I mean, obviously we don't have personal memories of them playing. Uh, Maybe Larry does. He's closest. Uh, (laughs) But uh, just kidding. Starting off with Lou Brock, you know, he, he batted from the left side, threw from the left side. Obviously, he's in the Hall of Fame, uh, two-time World Series champion, and he was a six-time All-Star. Uh, you know, the thing that really stands out to me is the, the ability to steal bases. And just looking at his numbers over his 19-year career, which is quite a long time, that's what Yachty's approaching, just to kind of put that in comparison. Uh, he stole 938 bases was caught stealing 307 times. So that's a pretty successful uh, stolen base rate. Uh, his last couple of years, he did not play full seasons. And his first year, I guess, if we're going to count that, he only played four games. So we'll say 18-year career. 16 of those years was with uh, the St. Louis Cardinals. And four of those, of course, the famous trade or infamous, depending on what side of the ball you're looking at, was from the Chicago Cubs. What do you think, or shoot to you first, Chris, you know, the career of Lou Brock and those stolen bases and how, you know, we can watch replays now, obviously, and see how exciting it was. It's kind of a lost art form, isn't it, uh, the stolen base? What say you? It really is. I know, like, in our era, you know, we're when you think stolen bases, obviously being a Cardinal fan, you think Lou Brock. You also think, you know, about 80s and Whitey Ball and Vince Coleman. I know a lot of us saw Ricky Henderson who ended up breaking, you know, Brock's record, but just watching the video of the way that Brock approached stealing bases and, you know, he wasn't known in the beginning for being a great bat, but he came into his own, like the longer he played for St. Louis, he became a better hitter, even finishing up his career batting good, but stealing bases. I mean, he didn't earn the nickname, the base burglar for nothing. It was I can't imagine being a fan in that era, getting to watch him on TV or in, in person, get to see that. But stolen bases has been like a lost art these days. You just don't don't see the numbers. I don't have it in front of me, but you you know they're not even racking up half of what he was getting in a full season. So it's definitely the game has changed. True. I mean, and to you, you Larry, also, I mean, you got to think that's a that's a heck of a lot of stolen bases. Nine hundred thirty-eight caught three hundred seven times. That's means his successful basically 66, you know, some odd percent of the time. Uh, the last guy that we saw still bases anything close to that was what uh, the guy nobody remembers because he couldn't hit. But you got to figure guys like, uh, you know, Lou Brock and Ricky Henderson are probably going to be at the top of the stolen base leaderboard for all time. And that's probably a record that's not going to be touched just because it's a lost art form. Uh, what's your take on the stolen base, you know, what Lou Brock did and how it's basically kind of faded away in today's game. To put to put it in perspective, um, do you know who his record he broke? Whose record held the record prior to him? Ty Cobb. Ty Cobb. Oh, oh wow. So that's how long that, that record had set before he broke it. And like he said, you know, when he was a Cub, everybody looked at him as, you know, a light bat, a lot of speed, kind of like a player we have playing center field for us now. And so the ability was – not just his speed, it was to be able to tell the tale of a pitcher in his move to the home to home on his pitch. He could read that movement and he was gone. And he would literally tell pitchers, I'm going to take second base. And so with that ability, you know, the uncanny ability to move like he did, there was always that threat. So that again led to mistakes at the plate, a bad pitch, a hurried or rushed pitch, helping his helping the offense of the other players in the team. And we've seen that, you know, in my time, it's been, you know, again, I'm not that old. I did see, uh, you know, Vince Coleman in the 80s, like you said, Chris, 
Ricky Henderson, I loved his I loved his ability on the base paths. To go from first to third on a single was just amazing. Um, it, the the game now is it's like we don't want to give up outs anymore. It's like the change to the de- designated hitter. Um, in years past, you know, you laid down the sacrifice, you gave yourself up. But now the individual players, their stats matter. And those are contract negotiations. So I don't want to lay down a sacrifice because that's not going to pay me. Yeah, it makes, it, it makes total sense. A lot of people don't want to make that sacrifice. And then a lot of the guys too, uh, it's kind of, it's kind of like a lost art form. And a guy like Bob Gibson brings a lot to the game, just how we talked about Yachty last night, Chris, with uh, his ability to do other things, you know, both on and off the field as far as helping the team win games. And other aspect you have to look at that is obviously the amount of times he's getting on base. Uh, they're not going to try to walk him because they don't want to put him on. Then you got guys hitting behind him, you know, in the order that have a potential to drive him home, take the extra base when he's already made it, made it aboard. That, it just changes the whole dynamic. And you know the, the opposing pitchers are watching him on base and are, are worried about him taking that extra bag. Just the, the different things that, you know, it can cause or disrupt, I guess is a better word, uh, for the opposing team to help the Cardinals win. And uh, it's just a lost art form in today's game. Uh, looking at his total uh, batting average over 19 years, he hit uh, 293. So he's basically 300 hitters his entire career. Uh, on base percentage of 343, so he's getting on base is a pretty good, pretty good clip. You know, he wasn't a big power guy; only had 149 home runs. Uh, you know, in today's game, uh, that's another thing we have to look at. You know, in today's game, with his stolen bases, you know, being 938, he had 900 RBIs uh, total. He did, he did uh, elapse 3,000 hits, 3,023 hits for his major league career. Uh, but, you know, his, his RBIs at 900 only hit 149 home runs. Chris, do you say a guy like Lou Brock in today's game uh, would make the Hall of Fame? Oh, I think so. I mean, like I said, the, the more time that he played, he got better with age, it seemed like. Um, you know, he was an all-star in his last season, you know, 1979, and hit 304, you know, and that, that's at the end of his career. You know, that's that's pretty crazy. And you know, the, the stats looking here, you know, from 1966 to 74, uh, he led the league in stolen bases every year, but 1970, you know, with 118 and 74, that's just, it's unreal. And, you know, he was, he got better with his glove too. Um, it, yeah, I think he would, he would be on the mark to make the Hall of Fame in today's game, uh, especially with, you know, even though the game has changed, I don't think his style would, you know, I think that was, what his strengths were and he played to his strengths and he knew what they were. And, you know, he was, he was a gamer like that. So I, I wouldn't question the era that he played in uh, his baseball smarts. I think carried would carried through. Yeah. His, his best year by far looks to be 1974 season. Um, he was second in MVP voting that year, made the all-star team. Uh, ended up stealing uh, 118 bases and was only caught 33 times. Uh, that's that's a pretty impressive season. And uh, his biggest RBI run looks to where he had uh, 69 RBIs in 1965. Uh, took a lot of at-bats. Looks like he played pretty much every game and every season. Um, his high was 689 at-bats. Pretty consistently up there in the runs. It looks like when he played a full season, he was over 100 runs scored. Uh, when he played full seasons, obviously, when he missed a couple of games for some injury, he, he wasn't. But he was pretty close to that. And then scoring 1,610 runs his entire career. So, you know, the that's over half of what he had for RBIs, which is pretty impressive. You know, that's a lost uh, art form as well. You know, that's one thing the guys like, you know, Dexter Fowler was good at that a lot of people didn't appreciate also with his ability to get on base and go first to third, et cetera, to – try to get a run home uh, to score to obviously help the team win. Uh, wasn't caught stealing a whole lot. Uh, struck out more than I thought. Uh, struck out 730 times uh, as compared to walks of 761. So that was a number not watching him play or, you know, being able to follow his career when he did play. That was a number that stood out to me. That was a little, uh, I guess I would say shocking, uh, was that uh, he struck out a lot more than he walked. Uh, and I would have figured a lot of people – well, 
I guess that kind of goes both ways. Uh, right, Larry? I mean, you got a guy like that with his speed. You probably don't want to walk him and put him on, do you? No, because the single would score him. I mean, it was the disruption, like you said earlier. You're a pitcher, especially a righty. You can't keep an eye on him. And you got to remember at that era, there was no – there was no yachty picking people off at first base. So the fact that he could get an extra extra step or whatever on you, you knew he was going to go, like I said, he could go to second, a, a bad play or a throw from the catcher to second base. He's on third. He could score. So the game around him was magnified just because, you know, the speed, but also the baseball knowledge to know when to take that attempt. I mean, there that's the hardest part, I think, in today's game, you know, the one aspect that I enjoyed about seeing Albert Pujols was whoever was in front of him knew if I steal second, they're going to walk Albert. And that's the differences in the game today versus yesterday. Um, a guy like Stan would be hit behind somebody like Lou and he would take whatever they gave him and he would be on third. I mean, it was just what it was. And that speed would open up a lot of holes, you know, the, cause they didn't have the shift either. A lot of younger fans won't remember that. So yeah. if, if the shortstop had to cover the bag, that left a hole open for somebody to go to left field. So that was the advantages of old time baseball, I guess you'd call it. Yeah. So, and that's what I miss most of all is just that that was when the game was more strategic. It, it was, it was a baseball knowledge and advantage. So. Even one yeah, more I think a lot of yeah. I was going to say even one more strike us than what you would think too. Like from 1969, he had six straight seasons with 190 hits or better. You know, that, that's pretty damn impressive. So, I mean, yeah. I even, even though he had an eye for getting on base with, with walks too, uh, you know, he was able to get on base. And once he was, then that's when he did his most damage. Yeah, I mean, he did he did get over 3,000 hits. And, you know, and guys like Yachty aren't even going to be close to that. So it is it is impressive because he did play for so long. And he did play up into his uh, age 40 season. That was his final year, 1979. Uh, still played 120 games that year. And uh, didn't did wasn't quite as fast with the stolen bases. He stole twenty one, got caught twelve times, so a little less than half, which is still impressive by today's standards. But he can still hit. He still hit three hundred four on base percentage of three forty two, which uh, you know that on base percentage was right in right in line with his career averages, and his batting average was better than his career. And he made the All Star team his final year, so you know he still was a good solid player all the way through his career until the very end. And uh, obviously, he's a Hall of Famer both for the St. Louis Cardinals and in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. So uh, overall, he had a great career, and uh, people are going to talk about him and his ability to steal bases for a long time. So uh, Another thing that I've just found that i looking through some stats and some information here. Um, in 1964, he did something that was unheard of. He got a handheld video camera, and he videoed every pitcher's moves. And that was 1964. So you got to remember, there's no VCR. This is Super 8 Max, and, you know, and he's watching black and white film just so he can actually pick up those nuances of the game. So he was, again, studying film before studying film was a thing. Well, just kind so, of one of those things where he was innovative and in trying to make himself a exactly, better player. Exactly, yeah. Chris, you know, what, 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 I was going to say, the year, the year that he had 118 stolen bases, he was 35 years old. You know, and that's – in today's game, if somebody's in their mid-30s, ever a lot of the fans are ready to give up on them. You know, and at 35, it was like he was in his prime. Uh, so that's, you know, another reason, you know, earlier when you said would, would I think that he would be Hall of Fame trajectory in today's game, you know, I, I think he's a timeless classic, and that would be proof of that. Yeah. And he also knew how to perform in the, in the postseason now. He was a, a key part to the Cardinals winning the World Series in 1964 and 1967. Uh, his playoff batting average was uh, almost 400 and would get on base 42.4% uh, uh, of the time. So he knew how to get on base. He also stole uh, 14 bags in the World Series, only caught twice. So he was probably more selective, didn't want to give away outs on the base pass and something like the World Series, but helped us beat the Yankees and the Boston Red Sox. So that uh, – that was pretty exciting. He knew how to perform and step it up and do what needed to be done to help the team win games. So, yeah, he had 34, 34 hits in 21 games in the World Series. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, that's 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 amazing. 
Well, then, then later on, I mean, we all remember him just from opening day, the, the red jackets, and he's always smiling and having a great time. That's that's the thing with Luke Rock. If you, were, if you were go to the stadium, you always would see him around the stadium. He would just wander around. That was the great thing about – I guess that's the best thing to me being a Cardinals fan. You would see those greats wandering around the stadium, and it, it was not uncommon to see them. I mean, I've been to other parks, and Pete Rose with Cincinnati – he had bodyguards sitting around him, you know, and here's Lou Brock walking around shaking hands and signing baseballs. So, and, and one of them's a hall of fame and one's not. <laughs> yeah. I met Lou when I was 10 years old and it, you know, he's very gracious with his time. And like a lot of fans will say that they met him, you know, outside of a game or just anywhere in public and he would never turn down an autograph. You know, he was that gracious with his time. So as good of a ball player as he was, you know, I'm sure he's a greater person than anybody that knew him loved him. I'm glad you said that. It is, the players were definitely different in that era. And he was, you know, a lot of people I think don't talk about his uh, ability to, he was a great, uh, he was good in the outfield too. I mean, he, he was a great fielder. He's at 96% fielding percentage. Basically that's pretty impressive over the span of uh, basically uh, 19 total seasons. He was a, uh, reliable glove no matter what so he was never a liability so that just a, just an all-around impressive uh career one more thing i just found was kind of interesting uh during the 80s and 90s after his retirement he actually became a spring training instructor for various teams he was an instructor for the 1982 cardinals the 1987 minnesota twins the 1988 los angeles dodgers and the 1993 montreal expos three of the four won world series that year that he was oh, wow. our instructor. <laughs> yeah, that that I did not know. So, hmm. and of those, uh, let's see here, how many times was it? He, he had fifteen seasons in the top ten and led the league in stolen bases. What three, four, five, nine times and got second once. Wow, it's tough. It's ridiculous. And now, not to, I know we don't want to run too long. I know we want to, we could probably fill a whole episode of both these guys, but we're going to switch over now to uh, pitching great Bob Gibson. Um, obviously, right handed pitcher, one of the best in the game, still to this day, records that won't be broken. They changed the pitching mound because of this guy. So, um, MVP award winner, I mean, nine time All Star. Uh, he did win nine gold gloves. So, two time Cy Young award winner two-time uh, World Series winner and a two-time World Series MVP. Uh, he was just um, amazing. I mean, his, his career numbers are astronomical. For Obviously, we know he's got a lot of uh, strikeouts, uh, over 3,000, 3,117 career strikeouts uh, for Bob Gibson. Just watching him play. And if you watch the MLB Network, shows a lot of Bob Gibson stuff. Uh, I watched the uh, greatest game with uh, Bob Gibson a couple weeks ago where Bob Costas is hosting. He's in it, and it's not not very old, actually. And uh, It was just amazing to watch him pitch, but a guy that can strike batters out like that. I mean, Chris, just watching and seeing how good of a player he was, I mean, that'll, that'll never be duplicated, and you still get the thrill of watching him strike out, all the, especially against the, the amazing game against the Tigers. He's striking out the heart of the order repeatedly, just making them look foolish. I mean, what comes to mind that many strikeouts and just seeing him, how he just owned guys with just ruthless aggression. Yeah. He's, he's another one that, yeah, I wish that we would have had the luxury of getting to see in person or even on TV, but you know, anybody that you talk to that remembers him, you know, talks about, you know, just how gritty that he was, that he would go out there and grind through inning after inning. And even during his hall of fame speech, you know, kind of, had made the joke that Red Shaney's would have left him out there, you know, if they were down 20 to 20 to nothing, thinking that the Cardinals would come back and score 21 to win, you know, just because Gibson gave them that the best chance to win. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of stories out there about players that, you know, if they hit, got a hit off of him or got a home run, you know, tuck your head and run first space, you know, or the next guy's getting it in the year hole. Um, you just, I don't know that that kind of a ball player in today's era. I know it's it's not quite the same, but yeah, he he had filthy stuff. Uh, would have loved to have got to see it live. 
Yeah, he he was uh, a great player. That I liked his his attitude, his demeanor on the mound, his body language, just the way he approached the ball game. A lot of people, you know, he tried to instill it into a lot of other players. You know, we saw Carpenter pitch the same way. Uh, you know, in, in some ways, you see Wayne Wright try to, but I think he's too nice of a guy. But Bob Gibson would just attack. You know, that was his plate. You know, he owned it. Don't don't hang out over it, or you're going to take a ball. You know. He, he played ball aggressively in the right way, and guys were scared. That was his mound. You know, he he owned the game. Guys were – I think that was part of the reason why he got so many strikeouts. Who people were scared to try to hit off this guy. And I don't blame him. I wouldn't want to stand in the box against Bob Gibson either, and I can't think of too many people who would say that they would want to. Uh, going to look at his games, I mean, Larry, he, he pitched in 528 games uh, over 17 years. He, he uh, started four and 82 of those. He pitched in 255 complete games, Larry. 255 complete games out of 482 started. That will never be broken. It's an amazing feat today if we have a guy do two. It blows my mind. Larry, what are your th- – Thoughts on that, that many complete games out of that many starts. It's crazy. <laughs> well, then you, I mean, then you go back to the Fergie Jenkins comments, you know, they, they, they pitched double headers against each other uh, and they split the outcome. One won the first game and won the second, but one wouldn't leave the game because of the other one. I mean, that's just the competitive spirit. And just to say, you know, Bob Gibson on an interview one time, I heard him say, it's my baseball game. Why would I leave it to some guy that's not even good enough to start? <laughs> so it was, he took it personal. I'm here to win. This is my job. You know, now it's my job to go five innings and hand to the bullpen. And, you know, that's that. And that's the, that's the, that's kind of spirit like with Wayno that, you know, years past, you always seen Wainwright, that offensive to take him out. And you can see that instilled his connection with Bob Gibson. You know, that, that is pride. That's that's your craft. That's your job. And that's – it just amazes me whenever they talk about it. The guy threw as hard as he did, and he wouldn't come out of a game. But then again, if you were a manager, would you go to the mound and get him? <laughs> no, and that's why they said a lot of times when he got taken out of the game, it was because they lifted him for a, a pitch hitter because they didn't want to go – they didn't want to approach him when he was on the mound and he was in that frame of mind. They didn't want to go out there and say, hey, hey, Bob, guess what? You're coming out just like, you know, when he was – pitching in the World Series against the Tigers, and he was uh, striking all those guys out. McCarver was trying to get his attention to look at the scoreboard, and he kept telling McCarver, I'm, I just want to pitch. So get, get ready. Here comes the ball. I don't care about none of that stuff. It, just well, to, you heard that I mean, story about McCarver going to the mound, you know, to, to get him calmed down once, and Bob told him, the only thing you know about pitching that is hard to hit, you know, get your <laughs> ass back behind the plate. You know, that's hilarious. I, I mean, the guy oh. took one off the shin – breaking his leg and he finishes the game for the W man. I mean, that's the kind of spirit you just, we cannot fathom that mentality. I mean, we just can't. I mean, these guys are so babyfied, right? What's that? That happens in today's game all the time, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. I got a blister on my finger. I can't pitch for 21 days, you know, but uh, something interesting I did find, did you know he played for the Harlem Globetrotters? Yeah. Uh, Chris brought that up earlier today, and I had no idea. In, in 1957, he had a heck of a heck of a year. He s- signed with the Cardinals, got married, and played for the Glo- the Globetrotters for a year. He set out for one year after signing a three thousand dollars signing bonus to go travel the Globetrotters. Comes in, pitches one year in '58, the minors, and he's a starting in the rotation in '59 for the Cardinals. I was about to say that too. I know he, he debuted that's, two years later. That's crazy. That is, he missed a year. I mean, after leaving Creighton, he left a year of baseball. He got that, he got that huge $3,000 signing bonus. He was going to travel around and take it easy. <laughs> Big money. Then. The Cardinals ended up paying him $4,000 to quit being a Globetrotter and to concentrate on baseball. That's right. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. That's awesome. The, the craziest thing about it, you guys is, if I go back and look at his numbers, I mean, this number blows my mind too. Okay. He had a career ERA during the regular season of 2.91, 2.91. And he pitched 255 complete games and he only won in his career, 251 games. So he pitched more complete games than he actually won with a low ERA. So that means he, he pitched during a lot of low scoring games to where, 
he didn't get any run support. And it, it, it blows your mind to know that he started that many games, that many strikeouts, that low of an ERA, and he got less wins than he did complete games. That just blows – that's a stat that blows your mind. You would think well, – if you tell – talk to someone today's age that doesn't, doesn't follow sports or statistics often, you say, Bob Gibson, uh, you know, pitched in 528 games, started 482, complete, through 255 complete games. They'd be saying, oh, he probably won 360 games. Well, no, he won 251, lost uh, 174. He, he won 60% of the time almost, but that just blows my mind to see you would think – he would have uh, just been crushing it with the wins, but he apparently yeah. didn't get a lot of run support in some of those years. It, it reminds me of another McCarver quote that, you know, said Bob Gibson's the luckiest pitcher that I ever saw. He always pitched when the other team didn't score any runs. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I was, I was going to say the exact same thing. So, yeah. Um, and again, you know, the off field stuff that we always talk about these guys, you know, um, they actually, um, Bill White, Kurt Floyd, and Gibson actually started a civil rights movement where the players could all stay at the same hotel rooms. You, I mean, we just can't, in today's game, you know, we're worried about certain movements going on or whatever. But at the same time, these guys are just trying to figure out if they could stay in the same hotel room with the white players. And, you know, we all, we all look back at the great Jackie Robinson and all he did for baseball. But here, you know, what, 20 years later, here's Gibson doing this. I mean, it just amazes me that what these guys overcame it just as African-American players to become the statues that they are in front of Bush stadium, because they persevered through not only just the athletic abilities or the trials they went through, but also just being of a black skin person and overcoming the racial injustices that we've seen through the sixties and stuff. And even now you see Bob Gibson, or I'm sorry, not now, but in the past at opening day, Again, another huge smile on his face, enjoying the moment he's out there and seeing, you know, the 42,000 plus celebrate his name. And it's, that's, I think to me, I think that's the biggest legacy of the two guys we've been talking about today is that their name lives on past the era that they played in. You know, who are those players now that we're looking at are trendsetters? Who are those guys? Are we going to remember the big poppies and the McGuire's and the Sosa's? our kids or their kids, you know, but Lou Brock and Bob Gibson, those are the guys that they set that bar that high. Yeah. They were, they were legends and icons in more ways than just in the game of baseball for sure. Uh, and then you go to look at the uh, shutouts, which I didn't even bring up, um, but he had 56 shutouts. So that's pretty impressive too. And you tie that in with his uh, wins and complete games you still think you would have a lot more 56 shutouts. That's, uh, that's amazing. Yeah. 3,884 innings pitched. Yeah. That's, you couldn't get him off the mound. No one will throw those innings ever again. You know, a guy goes six innings now. It's crazy. Can you imagine? I mean, he was pitching, he, he was pitching. He had what, how many seasons, you know, at least seven seasons I can see on here where he threw 20 complete games. That's ridiculous. Uh, guys wouldn't be – I can't – I can't believe his arm was still attached years later. I mean, this – he was just a workhorse, man. I can't – nobody could do that today. They would think that was unheard of. Somebody threw five or six complete games in the next year or two, they would be talking about how they're the greatest of all time, and they don't see how this guy does it. He's so amazing. It's just uh, you got to put it into perspective, and he didn't walk a lot of people. I mean, he, he walked 1,300 people in an entire 17-year career compared to the strikeout numbers he got. That was that's, – that's ridiculous. He, he definitely came at you. He, as a hitter, you knew you were getting strikes. Man, I mean, just the last couple of days I've just been watching some of this stuff, and just to see him strike out some of the names that he struck out in that era, you know, and the funny thing was – that high heat, you know, even today, you still still the coaches are screaming at those guys, stop swinging at that stuff in your eyes. But as hard yeah. as he threw, that's where you see the ball the best is at your eye level. So those guys are trying anything they could to just take their hacks and get out of that. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like the John Cruck thing when he in the all star game when he versus John, Randy Johnson, take my hacks and I'm running to the dugout. <laughs> yeah. So you just get up there and take them. It doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> 
But uh, yeah, if you even like his ERA per year, you just look at the ERA over every year. How the you know you never seen them those big numbers past his first year really. They just yep. didn't they just didn't happen. And a couple of years ago, uh, Smoltz when he before he retired, they were saying any pitcher that would win two hundred games that was a Hall of Fame career. That's you know these guys two hundred wins that was let's try to get that in the first ten years you know let's move on with our lives. So it's like I said again it's these guys are just phenomenal athletes back in the day and we don't realize it that you know think about the day when these guys played they didn't have personal trainers these guys held jobs in the off season I mean some yeah. of them worked at grocery stores or or suit shops or whatever, you know, that's what they did. And now these guys are year round, they're training and they come out after five innings. So it's just, you, we can't fathom the the differences in one era to the next. And now we're what say four or five decades, you know, past that time or whatever now. So it it blows my mind to see the numbers because we've seen the man. We don't really, you don't dive into those numbers on a daily basis as far as what he did or what he contributed to baseball. When you look at this, like today, like we are, it just even, even more blows my mind. And I, and I personally, you know, I did meet Bob Gibson once I took my little league team to actually meet him here in my little small town. Um, And he was as gracious as he got with the little kids. They were, you know, they were little league team, 10, 11 years old. And one of my one of my son's best friends on the team, he asked, he said, can you teach me to throw with me that curveball? He goes, yep, come back when you're 16. You don't need to throw it till then. But in the man's hands, he put that ball in his hand, and that ball disappeared. His fingers were like the twice of my fingers. It was just incredible. And you see this giant of a man, you know, what, 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, whatever he was. And yet he just – those kids, just you could see the melting or the, you know, the time that he enjoyed with those kids. That's what made it special for me that day. Yeah, you know, I had a I had a story that it wasn't me getting a chance to meet him, but you know, my grandpa that was his hero, you know, Bob Gibson. And at one of these, you know, caravans, he got a chance to go up and get an autographed baseball from him. And you know, I asked him how that went. He he told Bob he was like, I remember going to such and such game and you know, reeled off all the numbers that he pitched that that day. And he said Gibson with a stone cold look on his face was like, Yeah, I didn't I didn't pitch that good because you were there. You know, and it was just like, you know, I said, well, Grandpa, did he come across, you know, kind of like an ass? And he said, that's what I loved about him was he still had that grit, you know, of like, you know, I didn't do it because you were there. You know, that just – now, I'm sure he was different with kids, but he said, I, I loved it. You know, that was just a part of who he is. And, you know, when you get to meet your hero, sometimes you wish you hadn't. And I know that's <laughs> – that was a high, that was a highlight, you know, my grandpa still talks about. And that's probably why he was so successful the whole time, because that's who the man was. That was him. That was his personality. He wasn't uh, he, he wasn't just something he did for show for a ball game. It was just the way he approached the game and he approached life. And he, he was even better in the postseason. His ERA was under two, 1.89. He had a 7-2 record in the postseason, winning, you know, almost 78% of the games that he pitched in. That's that's unheard of. You know, you, you wanted Bob Gibson on the mound regardless, but definitely in the in the postseason where he obviously was able to perform and uh, shut teams down. And he pitched, you know, he started nine games in the postseason. Eight of them were complete games. So it's just, that's just crazy. You, the bullpen knew when Bob Gibson was pitching, they had the night off. Yeah. Uh, I mean, did. imagine just not even that for that time, but today's current time, you have a pitcher that goes deep into games, let alone complete games. That's a huge relief on your bullpen. For sure. You know, and one, one of the, yeah, you know, it was sad to lose him and Lou, you know, right after one another. Um, but it was kind of crazy that he died exactly 52 years to the date of that, you know, game one of the 68, you know, where he had 17 strikeouts, you know, this huge World Series game, you know, 52 that years to the date. Yeah. I didn't know that either. You guys are learning me up tonight. In my yeah. old school baseball, and even as a pitcher, he he uh, hit two oh six. I mean, that's Harrison Bader numbers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just it's a good joke. Without the hair, had to throw some light. But I like Gibson's hair better than I do do Bader's. 
you know, one thing too, that Larry had brought up about Lou Brock that, you know, I, I didn't know until I was kind of studying up about, you know, him being a base running instructor for those teams. And I knew that Gibson had, but I guess by Googling some of these images, you know, he was the Mets pitching coach under Joe Torrey. Uh, he was a Braves pitching coach under Torrey. And when I Googled this up and saw him in the Mets uniform and a Braves uniform, it was like, I guess you just don't remember that at all. But seeing those pictures was like, okay, that just looks weird. You, you're just not used to seeing a legend in another uniform, even if it's after their playing days are done. He must have had a strong connection with Tory because I know I know Tory was a manager for a while. I don't know what year, and I know Tory played for the Cardinals for a while. I don't know maybe if they I don't know if those years intertwined with each other, or whatever. But uh, it seemed like he he had a uh, you know affinity and affection for Joe Tory, I guess, regardless. But that's stuff I didn't know either until you had told me today, Chris. So that's one reason why I thought it was a good idea to do a podcast based on these guys for the season started because number one, what they achieved throughout you know, not just their careers, but their personal lives, the accolades that they achieved during their playing career. And then just even for us, you know, we're not experts, but it made us go back and research and see what these guys had done in their career, pay close into the numbers, what they did after. And, you know, if we can bring a little bit of that to Cardinal Nation to where they can also reflect back on these guys in this career and keep the tradition going and strong because they're players that definitely shouldn't be forgotten. And, uh, you know, keeping the conversation going is – is important and you know every every podcast and every group out there can go talk about you know everything that's happened today or who should we trade for next we should go get mike trout and talk about stuff that doesn't matter we can talk about things that do matter and things that really happened and took place and uh, players that actually changed the game and held records and will continue to be at the top of those records uh, for the end of time and i don't see them being you know broken or losing their spots at least in those rankings anytime soon so yeah, and that's another reason why, you know, I know some people uh, when Tim McCarver is broadcasting, you know, they get tired of, you know, his same old stories and, you know, him kind of mumbling about things. But, you know, when when he's done and when Mike Shannon's done, the stories of hearing about playing with Gibson and Brock and Stan and all these guys that, yeah, we can look at the numbers, but to hear those stories, even if they're tiresome and get repeated, those are stories that are going to go away when those announcers and broadcasters are done that I think this younger generation needs to know about because it, they are more than just the statues outside of Bush stadium. You know, that there is a legacy there. The stories will be the sort of the same, but the players will change because you're going to have guys like uh, McLaughlin and Horton and those guys talking about uh, Ozzy, which you hear about Ozzy now, but you're going to hear a lot more about Vince Coleman and Willie McGee and Ozzy Smith. And then we'll start to see that transition into, you know, Mark McGuire and so forth. The, it'll change throughout the decades and those players will, I don't think the Cardinals will ever let them be forgotten just because of what, how important they were and how the Cardinals organization does things. I don't think, but you'll, the, you're right, Chris, the story and the, the narrative will definitely change with guys like McCarver and Shannon being gone. And I like hearing those stories from those guys. It was, it's why everybody, I think, and, and, uh, you know, Dodger nation, you know, was, you know, sad to see, uh, Oh my God! Tommy Lasorda, not Tommy Lasorda. Um, ben Scully. Who? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, man. I don't know why I was drawing with Blake. I know who. He, yeah, see Vince Scully retire. Actually, you follow him on Twitter. It's interesting. And what? I don't think it's him, but uh, just to see him go because just that voice and you could Vince Scully would keep you entertained. He would just be telling stories. He wouldn't even talk about the game for two innings, and you would still. I would still be even at my age. I would still be listening to him just because he had that great knack for storytelling and you wanted to hear about the greats of the game like Sandy Koufax and Bob Gibb you know he would talk about all those guys not just Dodgers so our, that's definitely a thing of the past that's going away so our tendency from our group is that we we focus more on today's game but we forget a lot of our group members are that older group that are even older than me and they do they were there I mean when we posted we're gonna do this show you know, we were getting the Sportsman Park, you know, we were getting those stories that people went to see, you know, Bob Gibson or Stan the Man with their dads or their grandfathers. There's that's the best thing about baseball is, you know, not to steal a line, I guess, but, you know, hey, Ray, baseball stands the test of time. And that's the thing. Those stories always go. You know, you still hear the stories of Ty Cobb as much as you hate him or like him or whatever. They're still there. And we don't have that connection to him or that 
that his history, we still know the stories. That's the best thing to me. That's my love of baseball. Um, it's been around forever. No matter what's happened, wars have come and gone. Pandemics have come and gone. Baseball still being played. And you see some of our fans that you talk to that you, you know, a few that have passed away in the last couple of years. Um, we gave them a hard time because they wanted to, they were Tim McCarver, <laughs> you know, Hey, when we, when I was a kid, we started both the games of a doubleheader. Yeah. Okay. Whatever grandpa, I'll move on. But yeah. it is, that's our history. I mean, we are living history every day, but it's the fact that these guys are put into perspective for us when you compare them to today's game. And that's why I always, I always enjoy the computer guys that tell me that, well, if you drop this player back into this day, well, it's a different era. You can't compare them. And that's why sometimes I think we get caught up in the stats and the saber metrics and things. You can't compare the game. You know, there's yeah, eight, eight like teams Bob, in a league. So yeah, guys like Bob Gibson were pitching complete games and 110 degree weather with humidity on you know, crappy weather conditions and no airflow, wearing you know thick cotton uniforms and uh, almost almost dying from it. You know, nobody, the players of today don't understand. I think. Hopefully they do, but uh, I think uh, maybe I shouldn't say more so the players, more so the fans. I don't think I understand what players went through back then, and they didn't have the depth and everything going on that they do now. They definitely weren't making the money. They were in it for the love of the game, that's for sure. The, the one thing that I enjoyed when Jack Flaherty was called up is that closeness he became with Bob Gibson. You would, you would see that dugout picture, and you would actually see him gripping the ball and telling him, you know, hey, this is what you need to do. And to me, that was that passing of that torch to, hey, you know, Jack, you have a chance to be that next great guy. Step up and do it. And so uh, that, that to me, that's the best thing about baseball. The, the Wainwrights will come and go. The Yadier Molinas, they'll come and go. As much as we love them or enjoy their game, that next kid may be just as good someday. You just got to give him that opportunity to play. I did like that, and I think that's also another thing that people take for granted that the Cardinals organization has to offer is uh, legends that are still around. You know, even, you know, until recently when Red passed away, Red Shaney, he would still go to spring training and camp, and a lot of these guys still do. I mean, you got Willie McGee is a coach now. I mean, Jose Okendo is a coach. I mean, you've got all these guys, you know, and Lou Brock and Bob Gibson used to show up to camp, and they would talk base running, and they would talk pitching, and you know, a lot of organizations, there's a few out there that do, but a lot of them don't have that. And I don't think they have the amount of players that stick around for so long and that love to still put on the uniform and, and be involved and get involved in, you know, spring training and practice and, you know, hanging out and spending time with the young players like, you know, Ozzy Smith and all those guys. And I think we're lucky, uh, not only our players are lucky, but I think we're lucky as a fan base to have that also. Yeah, and it's not just the the legends, but even some of the guys that just played back in the day that had a decent run. You know, they they tend to always come come out. You know, to to celebrate championships and to to interact and be instructors. You know, during spring training, you know, you've got like your Isringhausens that'll come in and help with the pitchers, and you know that that's just that's something I don't follow other teams that closely, but to just see that many Cardinal alumni that several of them we have in the Cardinal station 24 seven Facebook group. And they love talking about their glory days and, you know, love bringing up just, it's neat. It's just all around neat to hear stories and to see them still have an impact on today's game with players and fans. The, the, the difference now is I see, cause like I said, you know, me being of the aged one here, um, I was telling Chris the other day, the Twitter interaction and the fact that, like, Andy Bennis being on our page one day, you know, that's Mark Littell. And I, I, I have conversations with Mark Littell, you know. Things like that, when I was a kid, was completely unheard of. Those guys were giants. They were superstars. You didn't get near those guys. It didn't matter if they played one game in the major leagues. They were still superstars. And so now I was teasing Chris the other day. I said, when I first got Twitter account, my first person that was famous that responded – Dexter Fowler. He was with the Houston Astros at the time, but he, we carried on conversations back and forth. And, you know, my friends would say, Oh, it's not a real, it's not really him. It's somebody else. But he would talk about his kids and his wife and things. And it was interesting. And that's where I think our fans today, they don't understand 
that they can actually communicate with those people. We put them on a pedestal. We couldn't ever speak to them. I mean, they were not readily available unless you went to a caravan or a special autograph session or something like that. And me, I'm a collector. It was even rare. I got to meet, you know, my heroes at card shows or autograph sessions. Other than that, you didn't see them. I live yeah. three hours from St. Louis. They don't shop in the same store I shop in. So, but, and I, I think that's part of the lost thing now where there's not that mystique anymore. You hear some of the younger fans, you know, the, the calling of players garbage. That's one of my, of my pet peeves. That guy puts on a major league uniform. I don't care if he bats 110. He's done something you could never do. And so give him his due, even if you don't like the way he plays the game. Yeah, they, they made it there. And he exactly. went through a lot of hard work to get there. He's living the dream. Any of us would give, you know, we even play for free, let alone for money. Yes. But we do have a lot of people that interact. I mean, Chris, you, you spearhead that with Twitter and everything. Who, who all have we had interaction from? I know just recently we've had a couple uh, players, players' spouses, or player spouses, it's, it's pretty right. Neat. Yeah, I mean, we, it doesn't matter if it's a Brad Thompson or a John Rodriguez or Colton Wong's wife or, you know, just people that they just follow Cardinal News. And, you know, whether they're somebody that's a former player, a current player, or, you know, it's just – it's neat that people will interact on that kind of a level. And, like I said, in our Facebook group, and you got, like, Andy Bennis and Adrian Chambers and Mark Littell and – Kenny Reitz and all these guys, you know, Bill Lyons. And it's just neat, you know, it's like, Hey, I remember that. Hey, I have your baseball card and you're sitting there carrying on a conversation, you know, on the internet with them, you know, Ray King, that's another one that's in the group that it's just, yeah. it's just, you would have never had that. Like Larry said, years ago, you would, the only conversation you would have is at a caravan or some sort of a meet and greet, but. We got relatives of famous people, you know, yeah. Mike Shannon's daughter, uh, Stan Musial's grandson, and his other grandson just joined the page that, uh, that happens to live in Tucson that I just met, which blows my mind. So he, he looked when, when I met him, he had on Sunday, he had his face mask on, but right, like right here, it looked like a, just looking at a picture of Stan Musial looked just like him in the face. So it just blew my uh, mind. So a couple of months ago, Kurt Flood's daughter, she was on, and she there, there's a push to get him into the Hall of Fame. And she was coming on and she was asking Cardinals fans of our Cardinals nation to help her support that movement. And, you know, that that's just to me, like I said, me being, I guess, the older person here again, is that that just blows my mind that that happens. I mean, we have a we have a school here in town for troubled youth. Uh, Jackie Robinson's foundation bought and paid for their new baseball diamond. I met wow. Jackie Robinson's daughter. And, that, and to me, that was like royalty to me. She's royalty of baseball. So. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Well, I mean, other, other than that, I don't, there's, we can cover these guys all night long, go through all these different categories, but I think everyone kind of gets the, the gist of it and we get the, the, the gist of their careers and how great they were and uh, some of the accolades and achievements that they've accomplished and, uh, how truly amazing they were as both players and individuals. So um, to uh, closing, Larry, you have anything you want to throw out there for closing? Uh, yeah, a little bit on the personal side. I do want uh, Cardinals Nation um, to say prayers for Chris's grandfather. Um, I know he's ill. He's under the weather and stuff and stuff going on in his personal life. So if people of Cardinals Nation could at least, you know, say a prayer, a quick prayer for Chris's grandfather, I'm sure he would very much like that. So, but uh, yeah, as that. as far as the, the our our Hall of Famers here, uh, like I said, there's not much else you can say. They're Hall of Fames. They're they're the greatest players. I, I miss not seeing Opening Day last year. I miss not seeing their smiling faces this year as well. So yeah, it'll be a different take, especially the fans. Yeah, they're not going to be making the uh, the lap around the uh, stadium this year, so it will be a different scene for sure. We've lost a lot of great uh, Cardinal legends the last few years with even in the last 10 with Stan Musial and Red and now uh, Brock and Gibson. Chris, a wise one, bearded <laughs> dragon, anything you want to throw out there for our exit? Well, I, I do appreciate the the prayers and sentiment that Larry said about my, my grandfather. He's uh, definitely a diehard Cardinal fan and, you know, Gibson was, was his hero and uh, a lot of people in my family's hero. And that's, 
you know, you kind of learn about the Cardinals through listening on the, the radio, whether it's KMOX or, you know, watching games with your parents. But, you know, my grandpa was about, he's who introduced me to the Cardinals on a, on a whole different level. So, you know, that's neat. And to, I had told him we were going to do this tribute show. And so he, he was, Hey, you know, that's exciting. Um, but yeah, yeah, I appreciate everybody that tuned in. And like I always say, you know, thanks to our subscribers and everybody that gives us a chance to talk Colonel baseball with them. And even though we weren't alive during that era, those, those two individuals were you know, head and shoulders above many, many players that we've got a chance to witness. So they need to be recognized as such. So uh, my one quick question was we, we actually talked about giving something away tonight to those that did check in and view with us. So one of the things that we talked about was using a keyword at this point, Chris, what's your grandfather's first name, buddy? His name's Alvy. A L. There you go. There's, there's your keyword for the night. Send, send that to send that to a messenger to any of us admins or anybody in the group and we'll put you in the drawing. We'll have a drawing. Jared, when you want to do the drawing, buddy. We'll do it on, uh, let's just go for next uh, week's uh, show. That's probably the best thing to do it. Submit your answer. Uh, send it to Cardinals Nation 24. I mean, you can send it to any of us, but the best is probably to the actual group page. Uh, one of us will see it, and we'll put you all in for a drawing next week, and we'll do it uh, on the show. That's probably the best way to do it, I think. Yeah. All right. If you like, if you like uh, what you've seen so far, we've thrown out a big different variety of shows. We've had bonus edition episodes of free agents and trades. We've had uh, regular season episodes. This is episode two of our 2021 season. It's uh, season, we're going to call it season one for us, but I've been calling it season 2021 just because the numbers line up. Uh, episode two, we wanted to touch back on uh, the great careers of Blue Brock and Bob Gibson. Next week, we're going to discuss uh, some of the up and coming younger Redbirds of Cardinals Nation and kind of give everybody some insight on them, our personal opinions, thoughts, though not experts. Uh, as Yogi would say, smarter than the average bear, though, in, in my own personal opinion, uh, on what we've got coming up, what to be excited for, who to be on the lookout for. Like Yachty said today, he's uh, excited for Kinsner and uh, Herrera. Is, uh, Herrera's another catcher we have come through the system. He's looking forward to working with helping those guys and get continuing to help get them ready for major league baseball. And he said, he thinks they're both ready now, which is a, a great compliment from the catcher. You know, uh, most, most guys try to want to hold the people coming out behind them down, but now Yanni's looking forward to the challenge. And so we're going to cover those guys in great detail next week as well as several others. And uh, please like and subscribe, share the show, tell your friends, uh, join us on our Facebook uh, page and group, which the links can be found in the description for this uh, video podcast. And other than that, we'll take us uh, take us away. And uh, other than that, go cards. Go cards. Go cards.